Caddis Maximus here, this time with a teardown of a DeWalt DW377. This is the older type Warren Drive 7 and a quarter inch framing saw. I'll say right off the bat, this one already has a burned up motor and it's not the first one I've uh, seen to have the issue. To really get to the point, you get a skill saw because when DeWalt, you know, Black & Decker, Rockwell, Milwaukee, they've all tried their hand at Warren Drive saws. The only ones that were ever any good were the little Porter Cable trim, Worm Drive trim saws. Uh, and then for framing saws, it's the skill saw. I mean, you get a Model 77 skill saw. By the time any of these other manufacturers started making Worm Drive saws, skill had already been in the game for decades. And they really just tried reinventing the wheel. Never really worked out. Never were as robust or quite built well enough as they really needed to be. I've never liked any other manufacturer's ones, and these DeWalt's are the same thing. This actually has a bent guard. We can we can see if I could. We can see these grooves here where the blade has been hitting the guard. Uh, not like guards can't get broken and bent on skill saws, but they just are so easy to get broken and bent, and not quite enough ventilation. There looks like there's some okay vents in the back of that, but when really, when you have these saws, they often are used in very high load situations, lots of heat, and you need robust ventilation. As we can see on the back of a skill saw, just the whole back of the motor is just one big grid. You can almost get, you know, your fingers through the size of those slots, as well as the dual field winding to offset the heat some. Much easier to deal with filling oil. The list goes on and on. Anyway, let me show you why this is burned up. This should be pretty simple. Now for the DeWalt. I'm only going to do this for a second. Yeah, there's like plasma fireballs up in there. What it means is some of the windings are, are either completely shorted or partially shorted, and then you get this conduction and actual electrical fires actually tracing around. It's just totally lit up inside there it's really hard to get on camera especially through the small vents but if you ever have try out a tool and there's just i mean there's going to be sparks and brushes and especially on older tools but you know the difference when the sparks are actually staying lit and actually circling around so the whole commutator looks like there's just these rings of fireballs you'll know it it'll light up like a fourth of july show and don't take that tool anyway as far as how it appears, you know, it is heavy. It's probably about a 15-pound saw, 4,600 RPM at 13 amps. Just not quite robust enough. So just wanted to take this apart. Pretty similar to a uh, skill saw here. You know, we got our standard diamond drive with the friction fitting. This is not spline-driven like on old skill saws uh, because this works as a clutch mechanism. The tighter you tighten the bolt, the tighter the blade gets. And it's kind of a safety thing. Uh, where if you're worried about it getting jammed or stuck, you can actually have put the bolt on more loosely and then the blade will start to slip rather than having the saw buck out. This one's been at least had something going on. The handle just is, they use these small screws to hold on the handle where Skill uses larger fasteners. Let me get those out of here and uh, get this handle apart. Here we are with the handle, pull that out. And we do have at least a reasonably heavy duty switch in there. There's our ground lug. Definitely looks like the wire's been replaced at some point, but at least it's simple with these saws to replace uh, the switches and the power cords, just because you don't have any reversing wires or anything else to complicate things in there, which is always a uh, good thing. Always got to change a million bits of some of these tools because they have all these different fasteners. Get that out of there. Get the strain relief out. Whoops. Always save those, get all this apart. And here's our handle. It's just gonna be a standard uh, fiberglass reinforced nylon. This is probably old enough before they stopped or started actually putting. Uh, on old plastics, they didn't put the grades of plastics. It's only when the recycling started uh, coming together that they started putting in uh, the markings for what type of plastics they are. It's an okay handle. Wish it was held together just a little more securely. Toss that to the side. Probably should get these brushes out of here. Let me finish getting this apart. Here's our switch. If we can just see right there, it is a 10 amp at 250 volt and a 20 amp at 125 volts. Decent switch, but uh, 
skill uses 22 amp switches, but these are always nice. Always nice to have switches. Uh, any kind of old tools, this is one of the few parts. I mean, almost all the parts are going to be proprietary on this. Um, but I do keep brush caps, and the switches are going to be are one of the most standardized items. You know, whenever you see a switch that's a, that is this shape in a tool, it's going to be this type of switch. And so you always save those. They pretty much last forever. Let's go ahead and get those brush, cap, brush caps out. They are pretty big. I noticed the brushes are actually pretty close to the motor. We should be able to see here, yeah, there's a lot of discoloration in that copper wire, so these have definitely been overheated. Look at the brushes, still plenty of life left in the brush, plenty of length. So this saw hasn't had that many hours on it, but when you're cutting, you know, full depth in wet lumber or pressure treated lumber, and uh, you have an old kind of dull blade, it can really put some big load on these motors, a lot more so than many other situations. Holy mackerel, I've never really seen brushes like this. Look at this. It is com that fried motor, the, ar the extreme arcing has caused the brushes to just get completely eroded and start falling apart on the trailing edge. That's pretty wild. That's some pretty severe damage in there. You can just see how much of the brushes have been uh, eaten away. Ouch. Kind of an interesting mechanism here. It's like a nut over a th hollow threaded, dual threaded shaft. So this lever is locked onto the shaft here, and so when you pinch and open it, the wear is actually happening on a replaceable stud, just like a skill saw, so that is wise. Let's go and get that thing off of there. Should just be able to impact that right off, just like so. There's our lever. This is the inner threaded portion. like so, and then there's a E-clip on the backside to prevent this lever from uh, falling. So the lever is put on like this, and the whole point to these notches is so if it gets worn, that you can loosen that nut and adjust this lever a notch so that it is in just the position that you like it. So that is a nice feature, although it's simpler to do on the skill saw, because on the skill saw, this E-clip's on the front side, so all you have to do is take a slot head screwdriver and nail, pop the E-clip, adjust your lever and then push it right back on. You can do it just right there in the middle of an operation. Say you, you fell off a sawhorse and bent it. You can just in 60 seconds, you know, adjust it. Where this one, you gotta have a wrench to remove the nut. So not quite as well thought out a design. Quick note, and this is the same on a skill saw. Is there is a cross pin that holds the bevel uh, hinge or the depth hinge. Then it has a little nut on the back to keep it from coming out. So you have to remove the nut and then flip it over and then use a flathead to remove the uh, big cross screw. Amazingly enough, DeWalt has actually put a little undercut. There's a little E-clip to actually capture this screw, which is something actually skill doesn't do, but I see why, because that little E-clip, holy smokes, it's almost impossible. You have to get down this microscopic slot to get it out. And there we have it. This pin was a total pain in the rear to get out. There's our little undercut. There's a little snap ring that they hid in there. Probably causing people, you know, countless hours of frustration trying to figure out why on earth they couldn't get this little pin out. And not only is it really stiff in there, it has this magically hidden snap with this E-clip, which not a good design choice. Here's their steel base. Even on this lightly used saw, you can see how bowed that is. Not as thick as it really should be. I mean, it feels reasonable, but it's not very good. Now we've got down to the base unit. Now we have to get this spiral spring off to get this guard off. I did a, a, went ahead and already removed the stop. With these spiral retaining rings, all you, there's usually a little lip, or you can just work a little screwdriver uh, just under the first edge. That's all it takes is just getting that first little lip going. And then you just walk it around. And once you get it started, then you can just use your fingers and voila. Pull off our guard. Here's our clock spring. I wonder if it's cracked. It's not cracked. It just doesn't have as much reinforcing as the skill does. And so, hence, it was able to get bent and really... There just isn't much surface for it to uh, ride against, so these surfaces will be wearing quickly and allowing it to get play, and of course the saw blade is now cutting into the guard. No good there. 
getting this outer guard off, we actually have a, a few different fasteners. We have a couple of 5 16 over here. Wow, that one was not particularly tight, and a couple Phillips head screws there. Let's see if this is going to be long enough. Some, I don't think these are DeWalt's factory silver ones are their factory fasteners. They kind of look like uh, somebody's afterthought. Somebody lost them and then put on different fasteners. Here's our top plate. It was held in by the cross through the body. Two screws up here and then two larger bolts up there. So I suppose that was okay set in, but it just seems like a cheaper version of a skill saw. See if I can't get the back part of this motor off here. A couple of little grub screws that hold in the hold in the brushes. And we got Phillips. These are usually are pretty tight on these type of tools, so I like to actually use an impact with a nice bit. Not too bad. I had one of the newer versions of DeWalt's warm drive saws, and I think they're a little better actually in the newer ones, but still not like a skill saw. I ended up selling it. I think I did a basic bench review of it. I like DeWalt's cordless tools, but you know, not every man every tool by every manufacturer is awesome. And that's what really what I've learned. Even if people have some issues like Bosch Bulldogs or a skill saw 77s, there's just statistically so many of them on the market and once you get used to them, once you use something else, they really just suck. Now, if I can get... Ah, I'm going to have to knock that apart. This case was on pretty tight just because the back bearing was pretty well jammed in there. And then they have a machined lip, so it stays pretty straight. This is where we finally get to get a closer look at the motor, and I was already looking at it. And if we rotate it around, we can see the commutator. It looks... I mean, it's worn, but it looks normal. But then we'll come up to these right here. If I can, let me get a better light. Getting stuff like this on video is always difficult for some reason. But if we look, we can see these few right here are a little bit more discolored. This saw was either ac actually seized for a couple seconds, enough to burn out a couple or partially short a couple of windings, or is a factory defect. But we can see that's the source of the fireballs because it's getting across those windings. And it's basically like a dead short circuit. And just sends huge amounts of power. The other problem with these windings is sometimes they can short out against other ones in other areas. Definitely no bueno. It doesn't look like a bad motor. Such a shame that it uh, went out like that. I want to be clear. When these are tight, you don't you try to avoid actually hitting on the side. That's worse. What I did to get this start going is since I had this post, I just used a wooden or rubber mallet and hit on this post. And on the other side, I just used a little bit here. I actually used a piece of metal because I was just tearing this down but tapped a little bit on this side to keep it even then hammered on this post to get this to hold to come down more or less evenly here's our field and we need to get these brush holders off of here or these spring-loaded retainers just like so and like so And there's our field, which is actually pretty nice. It's well wrapped. We can see that it is only a single field. Part of why skill saw motors actually do take more heat and actually seem to have more torque is that they have dual field windings, which requires more copper for the same amount of amperage. They're heavier. It's more expensive. But what it does is allows you to have a greater area of high saturation, giving you more torque per amp. It just costs a lot. That's why motors are like this. So skill, they have a coil like this. And then they have like a second inner coil, so there's just a wider area of high magnetic field concentration known as the dual field uh, motor. And Skill is one of the only portable consumer or you know professional portable power tool manufacturers ever even use dual field motors. They're pretty rare outside of like concrete core drills and that kind of stuff. And it's a shame about this DeWalt because this is a nice field. You know, it's wrapped and dipped. That's definitely, you know, proper. Too bad some kind of defect down here and all we have left is the brushes and I should be able to just tap those through maybe I should use a 
Oh, how can handy is that? You have to tap those two. They're usually pressed in place. This is why I have the mask. This is where it gets a little bit oily. Let's get this. These screws all on the saw seem a little bit looser. These skill has kind of, you know, this is a copy, you know, skills patents ran out just decades ago. And so all these designs are very similar to skills, but skill screws always seem to be very tight. These, I'm not even getting this to impact once, and that actually is a concern. Oh, wow, and that plate just pops off. That's all it is, is just a bearing retainer plate. That's kind of interesting in what the guard rides on. The worst part about pulling out the spindle is you have to use a slide hammer to do it. You actually need the spindle bolt, put it in there, grab it with the slide hammer, and uh, yank it out, which is... Actually, I don't have a very good slide hammer right now, unfortunately. I'll pull out the rest of this stuff here. Let's go ahead and get this lock button out of here. Even a little bit of smoke. Well, it did have oil in it. Ooh, let me get a flashlight here. No bueno. Can you see? Oh, yeah, you can see it just like that. It's all the brass. Look at this. Come on now. It's just like it's filled with glitter. So oil was never changed. A lot of wear. The reason that you change oil and these saws just like a transmission or anything else that has an oil-filled gearbox, there's a ton of oil in there. These are special pig blankets, actually pig brand that are designed for soaking up exactly this. It's just a, such a shame that... Uh, once you get grit into the oil like this, if you don't change it, then that grit becomes an abrasive and accelerates the wear. That's why changing oil can mean such a big deal. Like a skill saw, at least they're wise. It's hard to see, but there's an E-clip. Let me get my flashlight again. Right there. So if this leaks from around the button itself, you can take this out, pull the E-clip, and replace a couple of O-rings that are in it. Oh, and some, I'll do a review of these pig blankets, but these are actual oil cleanup blankets, and they're amazing. We can see just how much is in this. Just dumped it all off. Look at that. They really are pretty amazing at trapping material. I did realize that this is actually a bottom plate, so I may be able to tap this out. The other complication here is this, on skills, it's just a big hex. This, they're using two pins, but this is a, diff a smaller distance than, like, might be on any angle grinder. And that's where, and I don't know if I've ever reviewed this, Harbor Freight has these universal pin wrenches for angle grinders, which has this fork which you can adjust. And odd tools like this, in situations like this, is exactly what you want. And surprisingly enough, that was just hand tight. Everything on this saw is hand tight almost. That's not really not a good, a good sign, to tell you the truth. You don't want, I mean, I was expecting some of the fasteners to really require some hitting with that impact wrench and just none of them did so this is proper they do have a front bearing the deal with these worm drives is they have to main the gears really have to be absolutely in the same maintain their position they can have any wobble at all like even what a sidewinder saw has or a drill or just about any other power tool so all the bearings are pre-tensioned and the worm gear is supported on both ends with bearings and then there's of course a nut that traps it and let me go and impact that out Yep, those are these. These are those power belt Xeon sockets. Now oh, come on now. It's about the only thing they're good for is using with an impact wrench. Oh, it's still gonna be a pill. Nothing a few taps at the end of the spindle could, and that will drive everything out. The worm gear and everything's still inside there. We finally have a look at our motor. Really long spindle to get past the bearing, the seal, the worm gear there. Really uh, kind of a shame. Shame it burned up like that. Looking inside, I can see right here that we're using Japanese bearings. Oh, there's our bearing. It fell out. There's our worm gear. Now let's see if I can't get the driven gear out. I have to hold this. Smarter every day. This is actually one plate. DeWalt does it interesting. So this is the bladder. So this whole plate's held on by those four screws and these four screws. Wow.
a tight screw for once. So much easier than using a hand screwdriver. All right. Some of those screws are different lengths. Where's my... So the bladder, the deal is, is that the oil expands and contracts, but it has to be a sealed gearbox. So how they deal with that? Well, they have this bladder in here. This is the plate that holds it. And here, that's all it is, is an air pocket. So one thing you have to make note of is to fill these when they're cold, uh, because if they're hot and then they, you fill them and you cool off, it could actually collapse this diaphragm. It, the vacuum could actually pull the seal in. But the deal is, is that you fill it when it's cold. When it heats up, this is able to squeeze and collapse with the expanding oil, but without it having generating enough pressure to make it leak past the seals. And then as it cools off, it balloons back up. And that's the whole point. That's what these things are. They're just an air bladder so that you can have a sealed gearbox that experiences expansion and contraction with heating and cooling without worrying about blowing out the seals. And finally, to the very end here, you, everybody made it with me. These kind of teardowns take a long time. It's just not something that is done real simply. And uh, in a five minute video, there's just too much to go over. That's actually starting to give me some progress. Start working it back and forth. There is a seal back behind there, which is good to, good to see. Come on now, get out of there. Try to be more even. Really, I should be using two different screwdrivers to get this thing out. Come on now. I just got to get in there and work it loose. Always a bit of fidgeting. And voila. Finally get that thing apart. That's an interesting pin that's right there. Oh, I see. Those are for the screw holes so that they don't have a pathway to leak around the threads. They actually have these little uh, bosses that are tapped but still keep the th screw threads sealed. So it's only these top two screws that are actually holding it. And then here's our casting. There's the, uh, I don't know where my light went. Here's this light. This light is not very bright. Looks terrible in there. It looks like somebody dumped out a big gel glitter, a brown colored gel glitter pen. The, all the ink has been dumped in there. Real shame. Got to change your oil on these. I'm not a metallurgist, but Skill uses bronze gears or brass. And there's certain wear reasons in oil-filled gearboxes. There's certain reasons they use brass. Um, but we can see the real crux of the issue here. Look at all that wear. If you take apart a skill saw that is in any reasonable condition, you won't see any of that. But we can see without worm gear has just been eating away at the teeth. You can see how thin. There's a full cross section. Some of the teeth are almost at half their original thickness. So this thing was just getting ground down to nothing. It was basically, and that also shows evidence that it was doing some very hard cuts, uh, lots of pressure, explaining why the motor was burned up. And of course, this the driven gear is going to show most of the wear. The actual worm gear itself shouldn't be too bad, but there will there will be we can see right there. There's two lines where it's been grinding along the leading edge, but it isn't. You know, it's not as bad as the driven gear, just because any particles that are on this gear get as it's spinning kind of get pushed off. Where this has this. Can, can, each tooth on this has this continuous wear, so the wear is kind of disproportional actually on the larger gear versus the smaller gear, but this one is starting to get worn. Pretty much a shame, you know. I've taken apart a few skill saws. I've never seen a skill saw that's been this bad, and uh, I would never, if I had a tool like this tool, if it turned out everything was good inside and there was like a loose wire that was causing the sparking, I don't know how that would be possible. I may have put it back together, but as soon as I see gears like this, it's not worth reassembling. I mean, the tool is just completely done. I'm glad I only paid 20 bucks and made a teardown, a, a long blabbing teardown video out of it. Anyway, general recommendation, don't buy the Black & Decker, DeWalt, uh, older worm drive saws. Maybe DeWalt's new ones are better, but definitely don't buy the old ones. They just, 
Uh, they're pretty well built, but they just, unfortunately, just weren't quite as robust as their skill counterparts. And people seem to think they're worth a bunch of money, and they're actually just not worth very much at all. And it has to do with a few subtle design differences. Single winding fields instead of dual winding fields. Steel instead of bronze uh, driven gears. Smaller and not quite as high flowing ventilation. Not quite as thick and robust of a guard setup. Those, all those things are actually add up to what makes one tool that really seems as good or better than another tool is what, you know, is the type of things that you find out after decades and decades of manufacturing something and then getting feedback and seeing what actually works and holds up in the real world. Anyway, I really appreciate everybody watching and subscribing. And if you haven't subscribed, please do. Until next time, Catus Maximus out.